I often get the question of why should we care about angels or angelology and you know all this sort of heavenly other beings talk. Now, I'll admit that in my Bible college experience and seminary experience, we spent literally, this is not an exaggeration, one clock hour the whole time in all those years on this subject. So I thought at the time, even as a student and a serious student, because I knew at some point I'm gonna go on for graduate school and get a PhD, I just thought, well, this can't really be important because my professor didn't assign any importance to it. Otherwise, you would spend more than one hour. I think a lot differently now. Um, I would answer the question this way that whether we realize it or not, and most people don't, because again, this is sort of a topic that lives on the periphery, unfortunately. The way that the Bible talks about the members of the heavenly host, God's heavenly family, his heavenly partners, serves as a template for the way God thinks about and talks about us as believers, as his earthly family and his earthly partners. There's a lot of intentional, deliberate messaging that sort of creates this symbiotic relationship. You know, we're familiar with the phrase, as in heaven, so on earth. Well, there's a lot to that when it comes to the heavenly host, you know, what we would refer to as angels and the human family of God. And that's really missed in scripture. And it, that might sound like a point of trivia, but it actually plays into a number of theological threads in really significant ways. The, the, the big payoff for paying attention to the heavenly host is that if we have what I call the divine council worldview in our heads, we will come to realize when we get to the book of Revelation and even earlier chapters like Hebrews chapter 12, that human believers, the human family of God, actually forms the reconstituted, made new council of God. When we think about glorification, you know, the evangelicals like to use the word glorification, other traditions use the word theosis or exaltation or something like that. Human believers in their final state are made like Jesus, yes, but we become fit for sacred space in the, in the most ultimate sort of way. We as human beings created lesser than the Elohim, Psalm 8. Hebrews has lesser than the angels, lower than the angels. We are actually elevated to that position to occupy that status rank and form a, a newly constituted council for God, council with God to enjoy creation and to you know, manage it, do whatever God wants done in the final state. God gets his way with a restored Eden and we are his glorified family along with the members of the heavenly host who remain loyal to him. So we have a functional sort of corporate family partnership model going on here. And at the end of days, that's what we are and that's our status. Our condition now is kind of an interesting one because on the one hand, you know, we can see that, well, we ain't there yet. We're not in the new Eden. You know, we live in a fallen world. And the struggles that we have, the presence of evil, the you know, temptation, suffering, all of these things are due to rebellion. And scripture teaches us that very early on in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we have a series of three, both human and supernatural rebellions that create the circumstances for life as we know it now. But what's interesting, the New Testament uh, has something that theologians call the already but not yet sort of thread running through it. And it's actually a lot of threads. It's the same idea, but it travels on different trajectories. So God looks at us, those who are redeemed, those who are in Christ, as already being restored to the status that he wants to someday give us. So there's this already but not yet thing going on. So I think it's helpful to keep that in mind, uh, how God looks at us and what our ultimate destiny is, that someday God's thought about us will actually be our realized destiny. I was fortunate to grow up in a church that took scripture really seriously. And because of that, because we were taught um, biblical data and really, you know, biblical theology, uh, 
I never really had a, a much of a struggle with identity and mission. But a lot of Christians today really struggle with that. They don't really realize who they are. In other words, how God looks at them. There's this struggle with performance still. You know, am I good enough? Even if they hear the gospel, they say they believe the gospel, it somehow mentally it reverts back to, is God as happy with me today as he was 10 years ago or something like that? So it really creates a struggle with identity and it creates a struggle with why are we here? You know, what's our mission? So if I can get people's attention back in a correct way on those two things through the door, the back door of angelology, the heavenly host, you know, how God sort of, and, and the Bible maps that talk about them over to us and gives us sort of a more cosmic feel about our destiny, who we are and what we're supposed to do, that's a good thing. And I think if we do pay attention to that, we will be reawakened to how God does look at us, again, as his family, as his partners, and ultimately as his reconstituted council. When I typically get invited somewhere to talk about angels, I'll usually begin with a statement that sounds like something like this, that, hey, you know, what Christians think they know about angels is largely filtered or mediated to us through tradition. Now, I don't want people to come away with the thought from that statement that everything we believe about angels isn't biblical. I mean, you know, we have a lot of biblical data that is very discernible from the English Bible about angels. And so we, you know, we have a reasonably sure footing. But the reality is there are significant things that sort of get taught about angels, either in church or kind of in Christian discussion or popular books that really can't be well tethered to what the Bible actually says. And so in my book, Angels, the, the subtitle is deliberate. You know, what the Bible really says about the members of the heavenly host, you know, God's heavenly host. Because there is a disconnection, again, between those who really sort of burrow into the text of scripture and the way angels are sort of popularly discussed. Cherubim and seraphim are words that most English Bible readers are going to be familiar with as they're transliterated, they're not translated. So they appear in the English Bible sort of, you know, for what they are. And we sort of don't stop to think about these two as job descriptions. Again, we're not tuned into the nuancing of vocabulary, which is really why I, I jump into it right away in the book. This is actually where we get the idea that angels have wings because cherubim have wings and seraphim have wings and they're all just angels anyway. In other words, we smash all the terms together and that gives rise to this myth about angels having wings. But the idea comes from the notion, the, the reality that angels come from above, they're from God and God lives in the heavens. Well, how would you get from the heavens to the earth? Well, you must fly and you need wings to fly. I mean, there's a whole bunch of extrapolations here. Uh, even though scripture actually never attributes wings to angels. In fact, in the Old Testament especially, and in the New, when you see angels, there's only two occasions where anything about them is visually different than a normal human. Uh, when, when the book of Hebrews talks about, hey, you know, you need to extend hospitality to people because you might entertain angels unawares. Well, if they have wings sticking out of their back, I mean, how could you miss that? So you go back to the Old Testament, that, that statement in Hebrews is building off Old Testament incidents like in Genesis 19, where angels are on the scene, but Lot in that case doesn't know that they're any different than just normal guys until they do something that people can't, like strike the city blind, all right? That gives you an indication that we're dealing with more than just a couple of guys here. But visually, he isn't led to think anything different about them. And that's the pattern the consistent pattern uh, in, in the Bible. It's only when they do something really unusual um, that people get sort of clued in to this is, just isn't a normal man here in front of me. This is, this is something different. You know, is there any harm, okay, in depicting angels with wings? You know, I'm not, I'm not advocating that we storm churches and tear religious art, you know, that have, has depiction of angels with wings out of the church and burn them, you know. It's, I'm not advocating for anything ridiculous like that. 
I really don't think there's you know, technically any harm. It, it is imprecise, but it raises the question of, well, again, why, what's the point? And there are a couple of points. It, just in antiquity generally, this is why heavenly figures or sinister demonic figures often get depicted the way they do. Uh, giving uh, an angel wings just really describes their point of origin. They're from the heavens. Again, this notion of, well, to, to get here, they, they have to fly because we see birds. And it, it just, it communicates the idea that they're from up there or they're from a place where humans can't get to or humans don't live. And it works the flip side as well. You know, you, you have ancient iconography of, uh, like in Mesopotamia, demonic beings like the Apkalu. They are depicted at, at, at times with wings or at other times as sort of fish people. Well, why? What, I mean, especially we, those, those two things don't go together because, you know, fish, wings, you know, birds, you know. Why do they do that? It's to communicate that these beings are from places that humans do not inhabit. It, it's a way of communicating their otherness. So humans can't live in the sea, but the gods can. You know, non-human creatures can. Humans don't live in the sky. Well, the gods do. You know, heavenly beings do. So this is sort of what the artistic representation is trying to get across. Uh, really, otherness is the main point. I often get asked in interviews why a book on angels, and sort of my whimsical but still honest answer is, it's really typical when we talk about uh, the supernatural worldview of the Bible that the bad guys get all the press. I mean, everybody's interested in demons, you know, because of Hollywood and, and, and whatnot. They just seem to get more attention than they probably do. So I thought it'd be a great idea to actually have a book that tethers what we say about angels to the text instead of tradition, sort of weed the tradition out and just focus on scripture. And also, it's about time that the good guys get some focus. Uh, that they get some stage time. So what we want to do here is give them their due and focus on the good guys and not the bad ones.